Um, so I'm born and raised in Bradford. Um, uh, like um, my introduction, I've just returned back to working in the, the city uh, last week for the, the LEAP um, Creative People and Places programme and I'm the new creative producer there. Um, I've worked extensively for quite some time um, producing and particularly producing shows in, the out, in an outdoor context. Um, I have to fully admit it was an accident. So everything I learned was all learning whilst delivering um, in some accidental format. Um, so, you know, anything I say or anything that comes out of my mouth is learnt in a, uh, an active fashion. So take with it what you like and do with it what you feel is appropriate. Um, what I'm going to try and do is just go through some top 10 tips that I would say when you're thinking about making some outdoor work and then put some before that just put some context on it about who is currently leading the the way in the sector so in case you might be able to pick up some extra resources and information or follow those people on social media or, or on other channels to get some more um details and so forth um i also have produced uh, for artists i've also produced uh, an international festival um, so it's a little bit about understanding I come with both sides of the, the, the fence really some understanding from either side of the um, of the programming and the producing side for everybody um, so I'm just going to introduce you really to some um, the ranges of outdoor work basically I think um, we need to just have a bit of context about actually outdoor performance. So as you can see here, well, the the, the gear is not an outdoor performance, but it's a wonderful installation. So if it's anywhere, please go and see it. Um, but you can see here, there's these dancing puppets, which have actually got people underneath, if you look closely in, in black costumes, and they travel through the streets and dance to rave, or dance music and get people all excited and enticed into the festival. But they also do massive, huge festivals like Glastonbury or Greenfield festivals or European music festivals, which is incredible. And then there's one in this bottom corner here is this absolutely bizarre show called By Sea Migration. It's a little bit fuzzy, but basically that whole piece of apparatus rotates 360 degrees and they're constantly either walking or doing some form of physical activity on the apparatus, which is honestly insane. When I, when I was watching it, I was totally blown away by it um, and thought to myself, that's definitely a risk assessment. I wouldn't be rushing to participate. <laughs> um, you've also got then the, the, the bonkers Granny Turismos down in the bottom right uh, on segways, entertaining people. And then we go on to some stuff like you know, right in the middle, the Enchanted Chandelier by Trans Express, which is a huge chandelier suspended on a massive crane that rotates, it's got musicians on, there's live performance below it, it swings around, it moves, right down to Electric Hotel, which is a, you know, um, a series of rooms and a hotel installation by Frauke and Rosenberg. And then in the top left, we've got um, a show called Session by Dan Cannon which is a piece that he made with a community group um, and it's like a live concert type gig performance um, work. So the scale and range of work in the outdoors is humongous. And because, it's, because there's no walls physically and, and no, no parameters, people kind of work in bonkers ways and invent things like Block by Motion House, which is huge adult Jenga um, and Things like the moon, the Museum of the Moon, are in the bottom right. This is an amazing, amazing electronics um, artist who builds like connectable arms. And on the end of him, he has like drums or sometimes he just has a stick. And this person is like attached to this drum, swinging around, crazily playing and performing. Or the stick is going 360 degrees while someone's dancing on it. It's just absolute bonkers. Um, and that for me is one of the beauty, you know, of working in the outdoor sector. And um, it has no, it feels like it has no restrictions when you're approaching it. So you approach it with a real open space in mind. Um, and sometimes they turn into beautiful little moments like Human Hood's um, Arbus show, which is a wonderfully beautiful 
duet, dance duet. Our Tim Caston made a stunning piece of work um, called The Dance We Made. And every city that you go to, he works with local people who collect uh, stories from people from all across the city and they gift those people the story back in a dance. And then the dance becomes one big dance that Bradford would have made together, for example. So they're all beautiful little small things are huge, amazing, crazy things. Um, and there's some, uh, some more uh, interesting stuff. In the bottom left, actually, that's a really um, interesting piece of work uh, called the Actual Reality Arcade, where they took old games and turned them into like big arcade games for the outdoors for people to play and interact with. Um, Commonwealth's new commission is in the, in the middle there. Bingo Lingo, insane. They turned their mobility um, wheelchairs into pimped out bingo machines, as they would call them, and played bingo in the public realm. Just absolutely bonkers. So what you, you know, what you can make or produce in the outdoors is is incredible. You know, the the you could have a thought and think, oh, I can't do that in a the theatre, and actually you have that thought in the outdoor world, and you go, well, well. Let's see where I get to with that and let's see what happens. And then things like, you know, this huge inflatable arcade game appears in your street and you're like, it happened. We're done. There we go. Um, so this is just to give you a bit of a context about the scale and range or types of work. You know, there's working vehicles, there's work on bicycles, you know, there's interactive work, you know, it's, it's, it's very open. So take, bear that in mind when we're approaching and then just to give you a quick bit of context here. So there are some people who are working, who have done a lot of work as sector leads in the outdoor sector quite considerably. Um, outdoor Arts UK is one of those. They're a huge advocate and supporter of the outdoor sector. Um, they're an amazing organisation. I have to say that, well, I have, I'm going to say that, but I have to say that because I'm a board member. Um, and they do, they've done great things in the, during the pandemic to support a broad range of people who participate in outdoor practices so production managers street performers um, people who might not be class might not have ever applied to arts council funding but they do pop-up street shows and it's been incredible you know to work alongside them to do that they have a huge amount of resources online so please go to the website and take a look at the information that's online they've got covid risk assessments They've got risk assessments, they've got information about festivals and networks and people who you can engage with. So do go and have a quick you know, look at what they're doing. Uh, Without Walls is um, a new MPO and a, a huge player in the outdoor arts sector. Um, it's uh, run by Extracts, who are a, um, a, man, uh, well, a Manchester-based um, organisation and it's a consortia of the festivals in the UK who have come together to actively support the development of outdoor work. They commission um, extensively outdoor work. And by commission, I mean commission, full commissions normally for the creation of outdoor work. Um, they have a touring network where they've worked really hard on audience development um, with new festivals. And they've supported a breadth of festivals to come up through from establishment to you know well-known festivals in their cities which is great and then there's nasa which unfortunately is not a spaceship of any kind it is the national association of street arts um, and they've done some amazing resources during the pandemic as well um, over the summer to help artists and people get back um, out performing so I would, if you have social media or you have access to stuff online, I would read their websites, look at their resources and follow them on social media because often those are the people who might have some really you know, interesting information or some really important things that you might pick up. Um, you know, I've been frantically trying to risk assess two outdoor shows and the resources that these you know, websites have provided have been you know, absolutely imperative to me being able to make sure that those risk assessments are in the right place or for me to feel comfortable enough to say let's go back into a studio or let's try and get this crazy astronaut back out on the streets and floating through them and interacting with people so i'm gonna do some top 10 tips 
Um, feel free to take from this top 10, like I said, what you wish. As a producer or an artist, you, you might find some of them useful, you, you might find all of them useful, you might find none of them useful, which I'm sorry about. Um, but it's about you as a practitioner finding what works best for your practice. So we can put some stuff out in the, uh, in the open. You can grab at what you feel will be best for either a particular project you're working on or a practice that you're exploring. Like I've just shown the, the links to the website, my first piece of advice would be do some research, uh, understand the key structures or the organisations or how the sector functions. Um, for example, um, predominantly, well previously, sorry, quite a lot of the outdoor activity happened in the summer months. Go figure, because summer lasts the whole three days and then has a re in April and apparently has a resurge in September now. Who, who knew? Um, so the, the, it predominantly happened, but then there has been a surge of uh, light festivals that are now taking place. So now it's kind of expanded where outdoor work is kind of being presented nearly all year round in some contexts if you have a piece of work that's right um, for that. So for example, the astronaut um, I've produced for a number of years and normally it would just go out in the summer months because it's um, a street festival type of show but actually um, in the past two years we've had quite a lot of bookings from light festivals because they found that having something that can travel through the streets and interact with their audiences or transition people between activities felt like something that was, was good for the light festivals so do some research in that context if you're an artist or a producer, do some research around people who are already doing this. So there are a, there will be lists and lists on Outdoor Arts website and with that walls of companies who've received these commissions. Look at what they're doing, uh, explore what they're doing, look at their information, their resources, what they have online, because that will give you a good indication of what you might need to produce or provide or get to a point of with something that you're you are producing or creating yourself. Um, also, it's really it's really interesting to look at some artists and not align yourself, but if you um, if you look at um, some of the artists who are making work and you think, oh, my work is a bit like that, you might be able to pick out some of the uh, nitty gritty stuff that they mention online about logistics around technical or. Um, production values or things like that. So there'll be a, a range of different types of information you can gather, even if it's just video footage and you just get to watch a really great list of outdoor shows, you just get to see some amazing work in its environment, which is equally as important. Um, the light festival market is big now. Um, and I feel like the, um, the outdoor festivals are starting to present more work in the evening as well. So the, actually, if someone was to produce something that was light-based, it could have a 12-month uh, lifespan. Um, and before COVID, that might have been something that made potentially money. But, but, but we're looking at a different world now, so um, I need to explore that world a little bit more. And then I'll come back to you in 12 months' time and see what, where we're at. Um, but I think that it depends on the location. So I know Newcastle... Um, has uh, or the North East has a huge uh, biannual uh, light festival leads that's quite a big um, light night um, so it just depends really sorry I'm picking up a question in the chat there did everybody see the question yeah I should have said that sorry <laughs> um, and when you do your research if you find somebody you like um, or you find interesting I would say um, maybe try and connect with those people in some way. Um, or if you're writing a funding bid or you've got funding and you've got room for a mentor or, or a support mechanism, try to try to use somebody who's always, who's already connected because it can be really quite helpful and eradicate some of the really small things that you might actually miss that you didn't even know existed, you know. The amount of small things I have missed, honestly, is unbelievable. It's unbelievable that I'm, here today presenting sometimes when I look back at the things I've produced I'm like wow interesting um so yeah so having that little bit of support even if it's just to chat through and say 
I've got this idea, I'm going to do this and I'm going to present it like this. They might say, you can't, you can't do that because these, these are the logistics and these are the problems you might face. And you would go, oh, how do I get around that? Or how do we facilitate some creativity or, you know, space to get around that? Um, so that's my first bit of advice. Point one, research. Um, so the second point I'm going to make is um, there is a big difference between making a site-specific show and an outdoor show. A very big difference. So if you are making a site-specific work, you are normally working in a particular set of parameters. So, um, for example, you know, the Bradford um, Council might phone you and ask you to make a piece of work that is relevant to the fountains area of Bradford. Now, you could um, be amazingly wonderful as an artist and make a piece of work that can then transfer but they might say we want it only for Bradford. It's a one-off commission for us and it's outdoors. I would say that that is more of a site-specific based work. Or somebody might say in a style of maybe punch drunk, we've got a disused building and I want you to create a theatre show through the whole of this building in some way, shape or form. It's more site-specific because Outdoor work for me feels like something that is present in the streets. It's present outdoors and it's present in a public space. It feels like it's very public outdoor work. It feels like um, site specific work can often have some of the um, attributes of a theatre show. So it can be other outdoor work is usually presented at certain times you can stumble across it whenever you wish and you can leave whenever you wish and you can interact however you wish. Whereas if you was at something that's slightly more site specific, you might be on a journey for an hour or two hours, or you might be in a particular uh, country gardens experiencing something that's site responsive. So I think there's two quite distinct differences that, that you have to make there. And normally, if you make a site-specific work, it doesn't go anywhere else. It's specific for a, um, a site or a, or a place, unless it's a heritage project where there's a number of heritage buildings that might have that um, similar attributes attached to them. Um, yeah, I like to... Yeah, I can use some... I work with a company called Highly Sprung, who... Um, have made a piece of work called Home, which is basically a, a site-specific piece of work for Coventry in the lead up to their City of Culture uh, commencing. And it was very much about working with people from Coventry, designing a show that was about Coventry and celebrating all that was Coventry when we originally made it. However, they've also made the show that's got the astronaut on the big arm and that show travels to hundreds of different festivals, it performs in hundreds of different locations, grass, cobbles, I wouldn't advise that on that type of um, amber, um, different sites, different areas, different types of festivals, light nights, um, summer festivals, you know, children's festivals, family arts festivals, the range of works, because it was designed so that it could adapt easily to different spaces, whereas home, if we're going to adapt it, it's going to take a good bit of investment for us to be able to figure that out and do that. So I would say home was much more site specific and urban astronaut is much more about a show that can reach lots of people in lots of different spaces. So when you're thinking about making outdoor work, just remember that as well. Cause if you, if you fall in love with a particular area of uh, Bradford or you find a street and you're like, Oh, I love this street. It's so amazing. And you have designed the whole concept around that street. Um, if the intention is to only do it on that street, wonderful. But if the intention is for, for it to have an existing life, you know, think about that particular part of the creation or producing side of stuff. Um, my other, I feel like I feel like I'm in the controversial points. They get a bit less controversial. The other point I make is I don't think everybody can and should make outdoor work. That is my other. That is my other point. And I know, and I believe exactly the same about digital. The, the, the current climate has thrown everyone into this phase of digital 
outdoor, you know, open space, you know, craze, which is wonderful because it means more people are getting to experience more great culture and art, which I think is amazing. However, there are people who've been doing that for years and years and years and years, and it is a practice. Um, so being able to make an outdoor show or produce an outdoor show takes different, um, there's a list of different things to do. There's a, a list of different processes to go through. Um, you know, to start with, there's zero infrastructure. So when you step into a theatre or a rehearsal room, there is some form of inherent structures that you get given. So when you walk into a rehearsal space, you know there's going to be electricity and uh, it's going to be comfortable, it's going to be warm. But if you're making an outdoor show, generally you're walking into this open space where you're like, whew, and where do we begin now? So I think, bear that in mind. And also, you know, I worked with a, an artist who was making their first outdoor show, and it took us two and a half years to get from initiation to um, the actual making. And I know we all don't have two and a half years to play with, and now might be the right time. And you might just produce the diamond of a show that, you know, hits the jackpot, which is absolutely brilliant. And I will be right behind you, waving the flag and doing everything I can to help. Um, but if it takes a bit of time, it takes a bit of time. And I think you have to just bear that in mind. If if you go to the outdoors as a producer and you absolutely hate it and you think, I just want to be where there's seats. I know there's a money element in it as well, but just don't, just don't do it. If you don't enjoy it, like, you know, have a moment and say I can't I can't do this or at least give yourself the appropriate time and space to learn or grow to love it um you know or develop a love for the for the outdoors and the artists that I produced the show for over two and a half years you know the first we did an R&D and the first R&D I made I made them rehearse outside for the whole of the two weeks and I honestly got a phone call every single day being like, I hate you. This is not what I came to the sector to do. Why are you making me do this? What is wrong with you? And I was like, listen, this is your first time in this space. If you're making this show outdoors, be outdoors. Let's just get out there. Um, and it was just really small things like, you know, it was a dance show, but in, on a dance floor, it sprung the concrete is not sprung <laughs> true fact um, and the dancer is very clear with me about that um so you can't there's certain things or restrictions that has on the body then that you need to bear in mind so if you're making a show that's let's say really physical you need to bear that in mind if it's going to be on the concrete or if you're making a show with text and you're outdoors how is that text translating to the people who are watching and in what ways are you getting that text over to those people? How is the narrative coming across? Because people haven't chosen to come and sit for an hour in the Bradford Alhambra to watch something, if you see what I mean. So just have that in mind. I always say that, that and everyone always goes, <gasps> why can't everyone make outdoor work? And I just think, do what, you know, some people hate producing indoor work, you know. I know a producer that solely does outdoors and they live for that and they would never want to come indoors and that's wonderful you know equally can be said about um you and just figure out what works best and give yourself a bit of space to to kind of get on get on that knowledge bank and figure that out really um so the next thing i would say is you need to understand who is responsible for this show when it's when it's happening so for example a lot of artists and producers create and produce work that is then gifted to a festival program and is presented as part of a part of the festival program when that gift is given um it comes with a a, a large chunk of infrastructure um infrastructure like you would not believe like seriously would not believe. And if you are creating an outdoor work that you are taking responsibility of presenting, you, where is that infrastructure coming from? Where are those things that come with that festival um, coming from? And where is that budgeted? And how do you account for that stuff? I'm gonna to touch on some of that stuff in the next points, 
but we need to just be very clear that yes i'm making an outdoor show and it's going to happen in festivals so i need to figure out who in bradford i'm going to present that with and the infrastructures they provide now before i even start to make anything because if i put a budget together and start to make something and i get to the end of the line and i'm left with a full show and zero opportunities for presenting it what you know what happens with that then or you know you've got the wonderful you know bradford festival team on board and they are going to present it in their festival for you so you have to think am i doing this is this outdoor show my responsibility if so there's another chunk of stuff that comes with that is it going somewhere else and if it's going somewhere else you need to think about what you're expecting them to provide for you equally at the same time so things you know to think about I, I, honestly things like licenses you know who is responsible for the licenses for, for performing outside because you cannot just perform in the street it, it's not possible to do that um power if you've got sound where is the power coming from because we are in the street so there are no plug sockets well they are but mostly in lampposts that's a hint for you so try and find a site near a lamppost uh, <laughs> um, but you know where is that power coming from if you if you have your show up once you've set your set up and then go for dinner who is looking after that what who is taking care of that set while you are away from it yeah who is helping you clear a space who is helping you to stop uh, audience members getting on your set uh, or in your space or in your vicinity you know that they said things like this do happen it's it's pretty fun um who's providing the infrastructure so if you need sound and you don't have the sound equipment who's providing the speakers the sound desk the sound equipment blah 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 where is all that coming from yeah toilets if you have a certain number of people present you need to think about toilets toilets cost a lot of money so bizarre but they cost so much money and fencing oh the the thousands of pounds spent on fencing is out of this world honestly i can't tell you um but just really small things like that and each local council will have its own way of dealing with every single different thing which is normally why it's easier to probably try and create a piece of work that you gift um to a festival program and it's part of a, a festival program um because when you when we create home we literally had to do every single thing ourselves so we had to go we had to figure out how to close the road outside of the building we had to figure out you know even to the point of where because they had aerial performers coming off the roof the day we tested we had to close the path i didn't even know that was possible in case there was an accident with the aerial performers and someone was walking on the path below you know i didn't even know you could close a path in such a small area i was just absolutely baffled by it but until you've kind of got an idea or you you're moving with something you can't figure out as a producer what you need to get your hands on or what you need to get hold of so sometimes it's really best to maybe if you're planning on doing something in bradford try and speak to the events team or someone at the bradford council or someone at the producing hubs who might be able to say we know this is the this is the structure you're gonna to have to get through here are some of the hoops start thinking about those hoops now um and look at those or if you're writing a budget for a show now or you've got a budget for a show you need to look and say actually how do we make this so that you know this is successful and also especially in the current climate um the, i'm not going to say the rule of six doesn't apply because i don't know because i'm not boris johnson and i feel like only he knows the rules that have been invented but um the the covid measures that need to be in place to support performances now are much bigger than the uh, some of the you know the methods of security that uh, we had to take care of previously um so just have a moment to think about actually what th that type of infrastructure um staggered entries people gathering all the kind of things you didn't really have to think about prior to uh, anything covid based um does everyone kind of get the distinction there between having it presented with somebody else and then 
taking on the responsibility. It's as if like when you're doing it yourself, you're kind of creating an event of your own as well as an outdoor performance. And if, if you're presenting it as part of a festival, you you kind of get to say to the festival, normally I, I send a list of things that I require and they have to come back and tell me which ones they don't provide. And then I increase the cost of the show based on the things they don't provide. So if I have to bring my own sound system, well, I have to hire the sound system so that I charge back to the festival. Or if I'm writing a budget for someone who's doing some research and we're going to research outside, I write into the budget a portable sound system, how to recharge that and um, uh, how to get information about that and all of the types of logistics. Yeah, I, I'll show you, um, I'm answering a question here. So a little later down the list, in some of the tips, I'll go through some of the assets that I create and send to uh, festivals, um, <laughs> which is quite fun, it's quite fun actually. Um, and you can see some, like the, the, I even put pictures on them because sometimes I'm just drawing a picture and sh physically telling people this is how you need to stage the show is the best way to, to do it. Um, I once had a piece of work, a dance show, so we we put pic we put literally pictures in the back of the pack that said this piece of work cannot be performed on grass or cobbles because there's flips and backflips and catwheels and loads of crazy dance stuff and breaking and if we do it on cobbles, the hands can slip, they can fall between the cracks, we could have an accident, and if we do it on grass, they could turn and their whole body can stay. Um, in one position and their legs can all go in another position so just talking about the safety of that and you know we put physical pictures and big crosses next to the things that we couldn't perform on and then I got a phone call one Saturday morning and it was a one of the dancers from the company and they said our sound system is on a cobbled hill and I was like oh what am I supposed to do from here on a cobbled hill so they just picked a cobbled hill for some reason to present a show on and I just had to phone up the festival director and be like, listen, the cobbled hill is just not, it's not going to happen because it, now it's my responsibility for, you know, for those, for those artists. So I'll talk about some of this stuff and we can have a look at one of the, some of the assets um, in a short while. Um, so my next tip is plan sufficient time for this to develop. Do not underestimate um, the amount of time it's going to take to possibly make a, an outdoor piece of work. Um, if you think you can make an indoor piece of work and you are an indoor pro producer or pro artist and you're like, I know this by the back of my hand, bam, 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 you're going to step outside and there's going to be seven things that drop in your lap that you never knew existed in the first breath you take. I actually produced a show and we had we'd done all of this health and safety risk stuff we gave it to the place where we were rehearsing and then about, it was at least, we had three weeks of research. And in week three on the Monday, somebody kept walking past repeatedly. And I was a bit like, this is interesting. Who is this person? So I went over and spoke to them and said, hi, do you want to watch? Can I help? Can I introduce you to some people? And they said, oh, we're from the health and safety department of this organization. Nobody knows you're here. I was like, well, they do, because I can show you this email chain. And they were like, well, we don't know that you're here, and this is problematic. And then we'd planned to have a huge public sharing of the piece on the Thursday. And by the Wednesday, they'd literally said we couldn't perform or rehearse anywhere on the site because they hadn't approved the risk assessment previously. We'd been there for two weeks, bear in mind. They hadn't approved the risk assessment. They hadn't been notified. We were performing on a 3.5 meter high set and their height restrictions without Olympic approved mats was 2.5. And it was just this list of things that kept coming and coming. And I was like, I just want to share the work on Thursday outside. <laughs> Please just let us do something. Um, so as a producer, you have to just in the moment, take a refresh of that. And those are the types of things that are gonna land, um, you know, on the doorstep for you that you might not have had a moment to think about really. Um, and also, if you're an artist, because I know there's some artists in the room, your practice is going to look incredibly different outside <laughs> than it is inside. So, you, you know, if you, if you make indoor work that's really intimate and really 
uh, tentative and really um, beautiful and then you step outside and that indoor work is all of a sudden on a high street that has 75 costas and 33 Starbucks and a million people flying through them you're going to have to take a look at what that is as a producer and as a artist and say whoa what do we do with this now what what where are we at with this um with this at the moment you know so take some time i would say and plan accordingly plan for errors um you know plan for things you might not know might appear like i remember doing a project years and years and years ago and one of the councils required you to submit an event license and the event license took 12 weeks but our contact at the council had never told us about the event license and we were only six weeks out so it's at times like that as a producer where you're like let's dig out any charm that exists in my body and find a way to get this through in less than six weeks and then you you have to do something about it but if someone had have just been open with us and said this takes 12 weeks we would have planned to have way more time in advance to get the the 12 weeks through and there's also some things that councils operate called a sag which is a safety advisory group now, not all councils have them. Some councils do, some don't. But they include really interesting people, which is wonderful to a- attend for some form of producing experience. I do advise it. Um, but it's people who manage buses, people who manage roads, people who manage the fire service, people who manage the police. And I remember just sitting saying, uh, I'm, we need to think about closing this particular road off. And the bus person instantly was like, nope. And I was like, hold on, can we discuss this? And they were just like, nope, because you closed that road and I've got 17 buses to redirect. And I was just like, well, okay, so which roads? Here's a map of the city, colour in the roads that take less buses to be redirected and we'll try and figure something out. So you might not have to attend a... um, uh, a SAG or oh, someone's commented in the here to say it's the public safety liaison group um, in Bradford you might not have to attend it um, and uh, if you're part of a festival normally the festival would attend for the whole festival basically and get improvement um, but I would bear that in mind as a producer that you might have to sit in a room and particularly if the idea is absolutely bonkers um, you're going to have to translate that to some people who may not understand what type of bonkers we're talking about. I went to a festival in Great Yarmouth called Out There, and it's a wonderful festival. Um, You know, it's transformed how people engage with culture in the city. It's amazing. But they presented a show by this company called Gorilla Circus, which was huge wagons that drove through the streets They set fireworks off, they set fire to things, they threw things off the truck, they ran in and out of people. It was, honestly, I watched in pure producing amazement at how anyone had got this through any form of SAG group in the, the, they they mustn't have had one. That was the only thing I could get my thought around because I just thought, at the time I was working in Derby and I thought to myself, "I, I, I couldn't get this, I could not get this through that group of people without selling a part of my soul to you know in trade of it and it was just utter chaos but then I was thinking how do I how would I translate that to somebody who works in the police or somebody who works for St John's or and then trying to explain to them what well, what's the risk well if an audience member comes too close they're going to get a firework in the face <laughs> it's not a it's not the easiest risk to kind of you know put out to someone and say but I've done an assessment um, so just bear stuff like that in mind because actually I went to my for the home project I went to my first SAG 12 months out out of the project and in that meeting there was a ton of people who had events coming up in the winter months and they were getting an absolute tanning off the, the team members in that room the health and safety group was saying you haven't risk assessed yet I haven't got a production notice for this you haven't told me what the implication of this is they were getting honestly put in their place very strictly and as I watched I just snuck out 
as a producer writing all the questions they were all asked really frantically in my diary and just sat on the train back from Coventry like oh my god how do I get this over to people in a, a manner that they're going to understand it was just it's it's honestly some things are, are wild so although you saw the wonderful pictures of the chandelier on the crane the the, the extent of health and safety you have to get to, to get that chandelier on a crane is epically wonderful I like to call it <laughs> and also cranes are really expensive to hire so just to put you off making a show with a crane there a little bit <laughs> um yeah so just remember those things and then also um have time to understand the insurance implications that this is going to have on you potentially. So if you are testing ideas or the artist you're working with is exploring something like fire or fireworks or interaction, which I would adv strongly advise against now, unless you are in a hazmat, um, then um, you have to think about the implication that has on you trying to get it passed or risk assessed or safely interjected so when when i made one of my last shows we actually hired in somebody to do some really rigorous testing to do with wind and uh, weather because because the set was 3.5 meters high we really wanted to know that we weren't going to rock up to a festival and it we're going to be blown down with everyone on it um which might happen you know in the you could go to a festival on the saturday in the uk and get sunburn and then you could go on the sunday and get torrential snow it could honestly be that that epic for you so um think about the insurance then and then say actually where is this insurance going and where is this insurance flow because if you and if you are hosting the event you need to be responsible for every aspect of insurance for the whole event including the people who are watching you are required to have it by festivals normally but it's normally some sort of precaution in case you have incredibly mismanaged the risk assessment and the situation um you know for one of the things we discovered on the big the show i made is a big metal wheel we brought this cover for it because we thought actually if, we, if it's hot we're not going to be able to get on this wheel because it's going to burn the performers and that's a, the only time we might be able to perform is when it's, the sun is actually out so we should figure something out so we bought this big cover and it just covered it and it was wonderful so we went to Greenwich and Docklands it was 36 degrees it was absolutely sweltering we covered the set came back and we'd melted the bins and it was just like we have poorly risk assessed at two pound bins instead of this huge metal frame so we had to run to like a Wilkinson's and buy these two pound bins to put back on so you know you're going to find stuff out as and when you you get out there but things like insurance are really important things to to, to really think about now um and if you've got an idea jotting down what what it, what is included and then phoning an insurance person a specialist to do with um the performing arts would be able to say get this type of cover at this level because it would be the best for you to think about and also think about your insurance in terms of your um, identity. So if you're um, producing for an artist who's an independent artist and they don't have a company structure, that artist needs to take, or the, between you two as a collective, you need to figure out who's taking responsibility for the insurance and who owns that insurance responsibility. Whereas if they're like a limited company, then the company would be expected to have the insurance that could cover that could cover that. They're really quite some practical things to really, you know, insurance is a really important um, thing to be aware of very early on. And then with all that in mind, be very aware that budgeting is not the same outdoors as it is for the for indoors. And the, the structures that work outdoors are not the same. Budgeting, yeah, so if you are, for example, thinking about insurances, that needs to be budgeted for in a different way to what an indoor uh, piece would be budgeted for. If you are going to um, be outside and it's a full event, have you budgeted for all the things we're talking about, all the potential things, toilets, fencing, tape, cable ties, random bunches of things that um, you know, might appear. 
Um, I, I have a company that I've worked with, but it's normally a broker. I'm answering Sophie's question here. It's normally a broker that I've uh, gone through who's found insurance for the company. So I can find them out and pass them on. But uh, Lisa and um, the team might have um, some people that they advise or work with that could be good for insurances. Yeah, there's a few. We're, we're going to dig out some sort of guide, guidance around all these things. So yeah, I'll find some to share with, with folks. Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, as a festival, is there an overall policy we should look at? Um, I mean, I would cover, if I was a festival, I would get insurance for everything, uh, public liability and, you know, indemnity, any possible form of cover that you can get for yourself, get apart from they'll tell you at the end they don't cover a pandemic or anything like that. So be prepared for that already. Um, and speak to maybe a broker, because what we found was we had insurance for the company. And I had a slight niggle in my head about this um, show that had the 3.5 meter high set. And I thought, I'm just going to check. And when I actually checked with the insurance brokers, they had to get us a whole new set of insurance just because the risk was significantly increased operating outdoors in that manner than it was just operating in a theatre space um, which I was quite surprised about um, to be honest and I just thought that the insurance cover we had because it was so extensive might have covered that um, so once I can send over who I use as a broker and if um, Lisa and the producing of teams gather stuff together I would phone them up and just say listen here's what we do here's the type of stuff we have and here's how it works um, or in fact, because the festival I used to work at, we had a full insurance policy for a building and a festival. So I don't, I'd never had to do the specifics of separating the, the, the festival, the festival insurance from that. And even really, really small things like we presented the Museum of the Moon exhibition and we had to get extra insurance to post the moon back because we didn't have insurance cover to post the moon back to the artist. And I was just like, what is happening in my... Welcome to producing, everyone. <laughs> you spend five days figuring out how to post a moon. Who, who'd have thought? <laughs> so think about those things in the budgets and try and maybe get some um, conversations going prior to commitments or submitting funding bids or um, applications um, and stuff along those lines. Um, have an honest conversation with the local council about what their requirements are to do with events or if you're planning something particularly around that have a really honest conversation because you know one event license was 60 pounds another one was 595 pounds um, sometimes if you have more than 250 people or more than 500 people the licenses are more expensive sometimes if you have over 500 people you have to pay for PRS if you're using music from other sources that don't belong to you. So there's a whole raft of things really that can start to chip away at your contingency in a budget that you should really start to look at. So when I sit down with an artist, we have like an honest conversation about what the show, not worst case, but extreme platinum case might consist of. And then we go through the stages of got gold and silver to get to where we might land on a, a budget that feels like we can manage it safely um and in the right in the right way and always have a good contingency so always budget 10 you know i put 10 percent in which sometimes doesn't always feel a huge amount but if i was a festival i would probably put more in to be honest because you know things like travel for an accommodation fluctuate so much or you just never know. Someone might have not communicated a really small thing, which means you need five extra staff members for the weekend. Five extra staff members is like, you know, two and a half thousand pounds. So you've wiped a whole contingency out and then all of a sudden you've got no gaffer tape or cable ties and everything's everywhere. And you're having a small cry in a corner on a Friday night when you should be celebrating a festival. You know, things happen. Um, so think about those. The other good thing about budgeting, I will say now, and I think this is a positive about outdoor working, crazily, income, where you, where you seek support from when making outdoor work, 
um, can be vastly different to where you seek support from indoors. So if you, for example, are driving traffic towards a particular area of the city centre, there is likely to be more people in that space spending money um, in shops, in spaces, in car parks. So I think when, when I was at Derby, the director did a, a survey and it turned out like, you know, there was thousands of pounds bene benefit back to the city simply from car parking. Just from people parking in public or using the bus or using public um, things that result in money that we don't, we don't normally look at as cultural people or arts people. We, we just forget that, you know, actually we drove, you know, the festival drove 35,000 people into the city centre over a weekend. You know, and if everybody spends a pound, it's thirty-five thousand pounds more than that was going to be spent that weekend. You know, it's just, and 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 then when you think about it, you think that's that's insane. So quite a lot of areas um, have local things to you might be able to tap into, like sponsorship. So you know, for example, if um, I know the co-op or Tesco have tried to do more of this recently. Um, have sponsored stuff before in the past or have helped out with things in the past or have initiatives. Um, or some local councils have things called bids, which are like business improvement districts, and they have pots of money to help drive marketing towards those businesses. So you can start to think actually of income generation outside of the usual places that might be known to you in the public or you can make a stronger case to maybe local councils or um, other types of entities so in Derby in particular I only know this because I've just come from there there was a, a quarter um, called um, there was an area called the Cathedral Quarter who had sponsorship money there was an area called St Peter's Quarter that had sponsorship money so there might be different pockets of the city so like North Parade the area up there might have a, a set of people who are coming together to drive traffic up that part of the town. There might be a bit at the bottom of the city, you know, where people are looking for traffic. The shopping centre, every year we would get sponsorship from the shopping centre because we would place one of the pieces of work in the shopping centre and it just increased their footfall significantly. Um, you know, trying to, even if it's £2,000 or £1,000 or £500, it's money you didn't have and, and money to help actually lobby potentially money from somewhere else or show some form of commitment and support. And that's probably one of the you know, funnest things as a producer in the current climate is to try find that base of support um, where you've got investment. And often they're different to the council. So often the business improvement could give you money and the council might give you money. So you might be able to get two pots from the same um, area. So just bear that in mind. And, and sponsorship is a brilliant one. And one of the things I think about in budgeting is write the budget, put every single possible cost in and then say, right, who, who is providing this? So if, for example, you needed a crane because you've now decided a crane is your life, then you go to a crane company and they say it's going to cost seven grand. And you say, well, there's going to be 10,000 people at this event. So you're going to let me have it for three and a half there's a sponsorship element there because their crane is now exposed to 10,000 people. Not that it's likely those people are going to be like, oh, I must get a crane this weekend <laughs> on hire. But there is some argument around trying to business exposure, alternative methods of getting money, which might not be physical cash in your bank. But if you've budgeted £6,000 for that crane and it comes in at three and a half, well, there's two and a half grand there somewhere that you've managed to, you know, save or there might be local printers who can save and help with marketing there might be digital companies who can help with um, marketing or uh, audience development plans or digital strategies you know so when you've got the budget there it's pretty fun I have this highlighter and I'm like you I'll get you from somewhere or I might steal you from somewhere or you might come from this place and just get get on it and think who is in the city that might be able to help like you know we've just been in a pandemic and all anyone needs to do is go to morrison's i'm sure morrison's have gone to have some cash stored away somewhere that people can get 
access to somehow there's got to be right so think about and it was a bradford based supermarket weirdly i had to study it in business studies in high school it was a bit bizarre but um think about things in that sense or say for example if we know bradford has bradford festival and then um there is an opportunity they've got a, a bunch of kit they might say well actually you can just use our kit for free and what if that kit includes five grand's worth of fencing sound systems you know speakers blah 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 there might be um, studios or venues you know Carlos Sangam, uh, Mind the Gap there's a bunch of people in the city who might have some resources you might be able to tap into I'm not saying they're definitely going to throw stuff out to every person but think about where you might get some of that budget from that isn't just I need 50 grand to make this happen um, let's go make it happen now because you might find you can whittle that 50 to 35 and then you'll feel great about it I promise and then if you've got 40 and something goes drastically wrong, you've got spare money to do something about it rather than beg, borrow and steal from anywhere, which is normally what most situations lead to. Um, yeah, and if, yeah, the next thing I would say is try and do some of the creation. This is for producers and artists. Try and encourage the people you're working with to do some of the creation in the intended environment. So if you're new to Out the Outdoors and you say, I'm going to make a show on the street, then you should probably do some rehearsing on the street. If you're saying, I'm going to make a show on grass, you should probably spend some time on grass just to expose yourself to that area. And also as a producer, it's fascinating to watch the work evolve in the space it's intended for, because it's very likely that people will be around it in some way, shape or form. Because um, when you're in a, a theatre or in a studio or in a building that is restricted a little bit more so if you're making something not publicly but if you're making something in the space it's intended for it kind of opens up some questions very early on that you might be able to eradicate as a producer instead of getting to a, a moment where it's happening and thinking how do I fix this you might have actually seen it coming and thought I'm just going to go into that cafe for 35 minutes and do this tiny bit of figuring out on this risk assessment and sort it out. Um, that, is, that is one of the things I have tried to encourage working in the outdoors a lot because I've felt like a lot of work is often made still inside and then trans transferred to the outside um, or made in um, a space really that, that doesn't, it wasn't intended for. And you can kind of get some of the nitty gritty things out that you might or iron out some of the kinks really early on um, because it's so ex exposing for an artist outdoors. And, you know, I've been at some of the biggest festivals in the country where work is there for the first time and it's his first time outdoors and it's exposed really quickly to a lot of people in a very short period of time. And as a producer, that's really, a really, you know, you have to manage that situation for the people experiencing it, for the artists, for the festival, for whoever you're presenting with, who are your partners. It's a real big, you know, juggling act um, to, to think about. And also, um, if, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to say rock up to the, you know, Bradford Centenary Square with a crane tomorrow and start swinging around the chandelier, because there are lots of hoops you'll have to get through, you know, to, to do that. But Maybe, for example, if you live somewhere close where there's an industrial park and there's a part of the car park that they might let you use for rehearsing, you know, maybe you can use that. Or maybe there's a school somewhere that has a field that they don't use that you can have as a rehearsal site for, you know, for that time. Um, I think it always helps. And I think it's always nice as a producer to support the artists you're working with to be comfortable in a space that might be new. For those artists as well um or to at least be exposed to the space and not rock up and see because normally you can get to a festival and you'd have to take a sweeping brush to sweep the glass and the the cigarettes away from the area that the performance is in if you're doing it on the concrete so those are things to kind of look at um and also it helps you to understand the position of the work so just because it's outside doesn't mean it has to be loud and in your face. If you're making a really intimate 
piece of work, if you've done some testing early on, you can start to explore design elements um, or presentation elements or presentation locations that are best supportive for that piece of work that you're developing. So in particular, you know, if you've got a budget for a full creation and you've done two weeks of R&D and you've got to a point of where you're like, this needs, some, this needs an interjection and how do we get something from that? You know, you can start to rebudget and say, well, actually, we don't need money for staging and lighting because it's now daytime and I can turn that £4,000 into um, a set. And actually, this set is going to be a wonderful little, um, you know, tent style open space that people come in and out of. And, and that's because the, the beauty of the show was made for that. So don't feel you have to come out with like 17 drums and 16 glitter cannons to make a scene in the, the street. You can make beautifully intimate shows. I went to Greenwich last year and I watched um, Upswing, who were a circus company, perform this incredibly touching show about an elderly dancer and a young black dancer. And Vicky had come up with the concept um, because she would find that people were intimidating, uh, intimidated by her large black brothers in the streets, but also older people are not exposed in a performative way um, like younger people are. So it was this really beautiful, intimate solo circus duet, sorry, on chairs, and it was by the river, and it was just a moment where in the middle of carnage that is Greenwich itself, never mind on a festival, you take a moment and you step back and you think, how did I just experience that in the street in the middle of the festival? And it's so memorable for you. And then you turn around and someone has got glitter cannons and, and chaos and it's appropriate for that particular work. But, you know, and it was cited in such a beautiful area and cared for as a piece that as a producer, I would really want to make sure I have cared for the work that the people I'm working with in the same way. And if you've rehearsed outside, there is, you've got some understanding, or if you've rehearsed in a field, or you've got a bit of a context about how that might, that might pan out. And also, like I said, if there's gonna be narrative or something, because quite often I've picked the easier out really, and I've worked with dancers or circus artists, so it's all very physical, and um, I have to worry about if they do too much floor work and people are stood 500 people back and can't see what's happening on the floor. Whereas if you've got narrative and you have to hear the text and the narrative, if, you, if it's, you're just going straight outside into a performance context, you know, you need to explore whether actually do I need microphones or am I going to say, if you can't hear it five people deep, you need to go away and come back when you can hear it five people deep. You know, you, you need to make that decision about the, the, the piece of work. And then the producer has a really strong sense of how to look after that piece of work in, it, in, its, in its environment it's intended for. Um, I would also say um, share the work freely in those environments. So I've been trying to encourage this um, as part of my work for years, this openness. So if you were to make an indoor show, generally you do like two weeks of research and in the studio and then you do a test and then normally you test like people in the industry are friends and everybody has like a fun Friday afternoon and then maybe you see another friend and get drinks or whatever. Well, not, not anymore. Um, <laughs> in the, a bit of a reminisce there. Um, but normally something like that might happen. Whereas it, the, I, I've seen them every now and then, but one of the things I interjected was physically testing early ideas in a festival setting because people are there to watch and be exposed to out, outdoor work and, and embark on that. But also they could watch this. I would normally have this finished piece of work and then straight away as it turned around, someone would have a megaphone and say, listen, I'm testing two weeks in the studio. It's a five minute short clip. I need you to tell me whether it's rubbish, amazing, um, it needs this, it needs that. How can I improve it? What bits did you like? What things did you stay and watch? And actually people will gather. So I've done it, you know, seven or eight times now. People gather and I'm really open to having a beautiful conversation with you about stuff they liked. And they would say, I'd like more dancing or more music, please. Or I didn't understand why you did this. Or can you explain to me a little bit about this? And the beauty of that interaction is, for me, generally, those people are not people who 
would go into a theatre space or a um, a building. Um, so they're not coming and saying, well, back in 63, I made this really amazing show and I'm going to impose some of that on you now. They're coming and saying, I go to the chip shop on a Friday as a routine because that's what we do is Friday's chippy night. And on a Saturday, we sometimes watch outdoor shows and here's my experience of it. And that's super helpful for you because the majority of the people being exposed to your work outdoors are going to be those, I call them real people. So people who do stuff that don't involve culture and the arts, basically. Not real, but you know what I mean. Um, so try to do that. Try to gather feedback. And you can be really, you can be really tactful about how you do it because I am all about protecting artists and um, having a safe space to share feedback and share that knowledge. So you can ask specific questions. So you don't need to say, did you like it? because they're going to say yes or no and it's going to be the end of the conversation you can ask things like you know did you how did this bit make you feel or did this bit connect with you or did you hear this can you pull out that and then you can really start to get a grasp of what's working and what's not quite quickly um because you could have crafted a moment that you are absolutely over the moon about and then all of a sudden there's people watching and the moment is just eradicated because Billy Joel has thrown his ice cream on his sister and now she's crying and the dad is trying to get in the mix to pull one of them out of the carnage all while your show is taking place. That does happen. Or people just get up and leave full rows in the middle because, not because they didn't like it, just because they, they need to go for dinner now and they can go for dinner because it's a public space. So think about, you know, if you've done some testing and also, if you're new as a producer, you won't be so shocked when someone stands up and you're like, <gasps> the audacity of this. Well, you'll actually be like, oh, it's fine. They're probably going to turn around and watch from the back or they're going to do something over here. Or the artist won't be shook by the, the leaving of people. Because people do leave outdoor shows and people come late and people watch half of it and then watch the first half. And it's really bizarre that they've watched it backwards and forwards. And that's just the experience of the work. Um, yeah, so just um, just keep that in mind. Having a moment outside might help. I'm going to try the light again because I feel like I'm getting darker. Oh, it's better now. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Um, so testing outside is a good thing. And also you could do that in, I would say maybe do that in safe settings. So for example, if, if Bradford or Alhambra, you had a, a good connection there and they had a car park and you could use part of the car park to test some of the work on one day or something like that, you know, be a, be open about where you think, you know, you might, might want to test something. Um, next, production managers and risk assessments. They are a gift to producers that you never knew you needed very early on in, in, in life. Honestly, I can truly say they have saved me from some incredibly sticky, awkward, challenging situations. They are wonderfully amazing. And they know the things that people need to see at the right times. While I've got a folder that I think is so beautifully organized with everything in it flapping around, they're just like, boom, please let me deal with this next thing now because of this. Um, you know, when we made the, the piece of work called Home, we rigged three aerialists on the on the roof of a building and little i just thought well we'll just go up there with the rig stuff and the production people and the team will do the rigging and then we'll dangle the people off and then it turns out that we needed to have a rating for the roof to ensure that the number of people can be on the roof and what every then we had to find out what everybody weighed and then we had to figure out that they'd miraculously stored bricks on the roof somehow so there was you know really heavily weighted bricks in the corner that we had to move off the roof because we then couldn't go on it and then we had a problem because we counterweighted each of the performers with water and the water canisters didn't fit up the spiral staircase on the side of the outside of the building so we had to hoist the water up from the floor to the ceiling 
Then I had to go back to the stag and I had to ask them to give me the closure of the pavement for that particular day in case any of the water fell. And those are the people who just went straight into the situation and said, this is the best building because this road, this, that, we can pack here, this can be positioned there, we can do that, that and that, this is what you need. And then you can go to your budget and be like, oh, I don't feel like I'm going to be surprised in five weeks with something really insanely radical. So I would say try and get a relationship with some form of production manager very early on and budget significant amounts of time for their use. If you're making a really simple one person outdoor storytelling show that you can pull, you can turn up in your car, any car, a smart car, two seater, drag out your sound system, plug it into the socket, audio test it and go maybe that's not you know maybe that's not necessary but if you are planning to do something that might involve a lot of event-based details so these are the people who will say to you there's 250 people so you need seven toilets and then you need an accessible toilet and where are we going to support people with access needs if you're trying to get people down this street because it's only cobbled how do we get people to the street then also do we have anyone here who can sign we can't control online who's buying the tickets, so we need to make sure we've got people and the uh, touch points who can sign to help support um, people moving around the space freely and safely. So it's just really things that, like, as a producer, you're, you're always here doing this big stuff, getting it to this point, pushing it forward, getting it forward, and the production manager is always sailing the ship with you and gathering all the collateral and the information that might drop off the end and, and says to you at the right times, we need to just consider this, or we need to do that, or we've got to do this, or here's that. And then they produce these like stunning um, packs. So uh, one of the things, here are some of the assets. So the, here's a show that, um, so I, it's called Pulse. Can everyone see the screen, yeah? So here, here's a marketing folder, for example. And in the marketing folder, the assets I give, uh, um, it's my decision based on what I felt was necessary, but there's a, a document uh, that basically has um, a ton of stuff in it about audiences and marketing, so who it's for, why I've made it, um, target groups, audience finder target groups, how that connects with those groups. This is just a marketing pack for a as somebody to use how the structure of the show might work so this particular show is only 22 minutes long so it happens twice a day 22 minutes long here's the performance structure of it we have an interactive session after one of the shows so there's a very clear um articulation of how it might look what some of this the sessions are so stay and play is the interactive session what um what accessible elements do we have so there is an audio description for the show you can actually download the audio description before you attend the festival and listen through your own device. So you can just be in the audience and we will say, Pulse is about to start, please press play. And you can just be in the audience and experience the show like a festival attendee. Um, lots of selling points, information about who's done what. Um, randomly, I have to say this particular show, I did manage to convince the manufacturers Rolls Royce to create the set in a freak accident of mine where I just asked and they said yeah and then I didn't say anything until it was delivered um but I saved that was the way in the budget I saved money and actually I had asked to work with them to do the testing for the wind so I asked if they would test the wind basically for us in a efficient way and then there's brochure copy and stuff so that would be marketing and that's information there. And then in the, in the technical side of stuff, and this is what I work with the production manager to develop, we have insurance documents. We have a model of the, of the wheel, so a final design of the wheel there. Um, my computer's going to go slowly. So that's what the wheel looks like. Um, I include uh, a wet weather contingency plan here. So here's what happens, here's how we monitor Here's what we do about weather. You'll notice one of my main points isn't weather because there's really nothing we can do about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's the plan. There's a risk assessment here. 
there's a technical spec there's a method statement on how we uh, set the setup um, which specifically focuses on safety safety guidelines on how people will set it up uh, a checklist that everyone has to do um, you know so there's lots of things where there's checking points for safety and insurance purposes in there but i i can't take credit for all the information that's in there because i worked with a production manager to make sure it was rigorous and fully up to spec um, because also it helps when you get to that um, space or you get to the place where you're at um, and then basically they'll they'll do the the main part of the setting up for you and you can just add on the stuff that's needed and then the last point which is nicely rounding up I think is about audiences outdoor work isn't for everybody fact so when you make an indoor show you make it for a specific target group the same will happen in an outdoor context so you might say i've made a family show which is for families but you might find there are people who have come to the festivals or events alone you might find people who have come in couples without children or you might find people who've come as an older family and it might not be for a family that has a 76 year old grandparent a 50 year old mum and a 29 year old um, child they're going, they're looking for something else so please 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 when producing outdoor shows understand who it's intended for because the worst thing is to expose somebody really quickly to something that could put audiences off in the future and that does happen and that has happened you know it's so easy to watch something outdoors, have a bad experience, and then never go to an outdoor cultural event or a cultural space again. Um, so think about who it's intended for. You know, if you've made a piece about knife crime, for example, and you have booked to do the show at the end of September, and then next week, all of a sudden, there is a series of uh, incidents that involve knives. As a producer, we need to take an assessment about whether or not now and that particular work is the appropriate time to be in the public space and the public domain. You know, there are things like that that just need to be considered. And also, I mean, I do agree that everyone, everyone sh should and is entitled to experience great culture, but I don't think we can make, we, unless, you, unless you've got this like formula, which I would, you should sell. I don't know if, you, if people make a particular piece for everybody. You know, you'd be able to watch something and unpick, say, actually, these are the target, targeted people that is intended for. So if I was making a piece of work for adults, some of the choreographic content that's in the Big Wheel show would not be in there because it's a family show. There's content in there, not pantomime, but a bit like there's content for adults that the young people will miss and there's content for young people that the adults will find Peppa Pig style irritating. Do you know what I mean? It's like a... Um, a balancing act in that sense um, so I think just having an understanding of I am making this for 12 to 16 year olds is totally fine because other people will watch it and love it and experience it and have a great time or they won't but you then at least know that as a producer you're supporting the people and the artists you're working with to get to this point of where shoop, here's what this is and who, here's who it's for and that rounds up the tips sorry it is a lot of information and talking i am so aware of that and it's probably really not that interesting so i'm also sorry about that as well um but did anyone have any like burning questions or things they feel might help or i might be able to answer or anything um sorry i just thought i'd jump in yeah, um yeah. uh so thank you for that that was really really useful um i i was speaking with a production manager separately about a project that I'm working on uh, to film in an indoor swimming pool. And he said that a lot of the same rules applied because you have water involved. And that is also something that sometimes comes from the sky. So I just thought I'd kind of add that is that sometimes potentially uh, indoor projects might need to learn from some of the outdoor project management potentially. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I, um, I, I, I think every everybody can learn from everybody and and share lots of wonderful knowledge and information. Because also things that are happening indoors now are getting equally as insane as 
outdoors and some of the risk assessments that exist in the outdoors can can be used and relevant inside it's just a lot of like i feel like the tips are things to like look out for like be mindful of audiences if you're making it in a new space make it there if it's for families how do the families interact with it and which parts of the families because also the one thing i i don't have children and the one thing i totally forget and this was really brought to my mind when i programmed in indoor space was if you have a child of one age and a child of another age the pattern is so drastically different when you're trying to book shows and you're trying to figure out which is the best time like i remember speaking to a parent who was just like no time we will just come to whichever show there are tickets for and we will hope for the best. And it was as if like I was trying to find this weird formula that I thought existed and it was just, yeah, totally, you know, a, a, an interesting um, experience for me. And then outdoors would be the same, you know, one, one child might sleep at 12 and one might sleep at three and then you've got one sleeping, one awake and what's, you, you can't plan for that. You just can't plan for that so you have to some things you just have to say do you know what I, I cannot I cannot produce that part of this world so I'm just going to go with the things I can control um, and a lot of outdoor stuff is pre-planning it's really having an understanding of what might come at you a bit later down the line and trying to risk you know eliminate some of that risk for you um, because when you're in the middle of getting to a point of where you're finalizing the creation of, for an artist as a producer, that's quite an intense point as well. And if you're both in this intense period of where something's been realised and things are firing at your left, right and centre that you cannot control, um, you know, if you've kind of planned to, to get through that, it's helpful. Thanks everyone. Hi Phil. Thanks a lot. Hi Carlos, you're right. Ah, yes, <laughs> hi, uh, quick question. Um, I was wondering, you know, when you're talking about insurance, um, and see, you've been mentioning quite like, I feel like uh, very kind of, uh, I don't want to say acrobatic, but you know, things with cranes and you know, you've got the, 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 that kind of scale of work. When you're talking about like producing uh, dance work that happens outdoors, you know, more kind of like standardized, you know, where the focus is dance rather than effects or uh, would you still say that we need to like be looking at insurance that's different to what we would normally be using when touring? Yeah, I would check in and make sure absolutely 100% because the exposure and the contact is different, um, particularly if you've got a set. Yeah. So even though I would say that the yeah. whole show is a relatively small scale show. Um, and that's why when I was making it, I was just like, well, I don't need to fund the insurer. Well, we've got insurance. And then halfway down the line they were like no you really need to think about this extra stuff so if you've got sets and stuff that, and okay. things that people are interactive with um because of weather as well sometimes the risk assessments and the yeah. insurances need to be just a little bit different and and the, the safety around those need to be cared for so if yeah. you're using someone with like a okay. suit that's really um uh, if it gets wet they can be electrocuted and you're parading them around in the rain the whole time it's you know what i mean that the, the it's a bit different having them do that indoors. Yeah. So you just need to make sure. And also the likelihood of you coming into contact with the person from the public outdoors is significantly increased than in the indoors, unless there's some form of stage invader, Britain's Got Talent throwing eggs at Simon Cowell style that uh, happens. You know, yeah. <laughs> people might be accidentally going to space. So I'd just bear that in mind. Quick question. Uh, when you're talking about uh, being in the space that you're creating in, uh, especially if you kind of have an idea where you're going to make the work, um, when, it, you know, when I'm talking about prior to actually performing it, um, if, do you think it's, what are the kind of the practicalities of actually being able to rehearse or, or kind of like just spend time in the space doing some work if it's a public space? Is it yeah. complicated or? Yeah, so when I was, yeah yeah i would say it's a little bit it's a little bit tricky which is why i said maybe try and find somebody who has a public space that you can um commandeer in some way so for example if uh, if you're you have a partner who uh, like a um a partner for the project who has a car park or um a large foyer or something that isn't a sprung contained dance floor with mirrors um it's super helpful yeah. because you know, dan dance is really di difficult outside and it's really telling on the body. 
and we tried at least yeah. 15 different types of trainers and shoes before we got to a pair that was the right for the performance to wear. Um, and that in itself yeah. was a fleet of producing on eBay that I didn't know existed. So I was frantically finding brands and types and stuff on eBay trying to get the right stuff. So maybe if, you, yeah. if you've developed partnerships, and there might be a way, I don't know, that the producing hubs can facilitate something at some point with introductions to partners who might have appropriate um, locations to kind of do that. Um, or even if, even if it's somewhere, you know, when I was, if, if the council are supportive, the council might be able to carve you out a small area uh, near them for you to just rehearse. And the, the fact of the matter is, is people will probably just pass by and interact in some way. Um, but you, you do need to go through the permissions because if you're blaring out um, Beyonce's single ladies in the middle of the street, people are going <laughs> to watch and gather and it's going to be, then you start to get all these restrictions that are in uh, place. So, so um, I am, crea I have created and I'm growing a celebration of the patron saint of wool first uh, February, uh, first weekend of February it's already reasonably big and it's all indoors I've been talking to um, a, I don't know if he's a dance producer, he just knows dancing he's involved with dancing and one of his suggestions was for the festival which is basically you advertise the festival we advertise you so at the minute there is no money but I'm, we're applying for money to, to pay but Dancing, he was suggesting, was in empty shops in Bradford, of which there are many. Is there issues with licensing? We haven't talked about it. We haven't done anything about it. But if dancers are performing in empty shops to a public that has stood on the pavement, is there things that I, we should be aware of? Yeah, I would say, I would, if, if you're, I would partner with the council first because the yes. in the council. Yeah who's got the connections for those shops. Um, that it, also, it will have to be in council, council, that's the idea, yeah. that we get in touch with the council and they tell us where this might be possible. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great way. And then they will give you any restrictions that they personally yeah. have about that project. I would say, if I was you, I would still get a production manager in or someone of some sort now, because there are some risks there currently in the current government rules about people stopping and gathering and because you are advertising people stopping to experience a performative element in a shop window that you then become the, the insurance floor potentially yeah. more on you so if loads of people then stop outside that shop they're not socially distanced you don't have stewards to help that there's no cleaning facilities people are not wearing masks there is a a, a bit of a uh, a moment, a producing moment there where you need to say, okay, if we're having shops, we will have stewards who usher yeah. people along and you only experience snippets of the performance. Or if you have to stop, then you'll need to create some form of ticketing system that can track people, some form of stewarding system and fencing that can keep people distanced and some form of separation from the actual public who might then still gather. So basically, uh, when, I'm, when I'm writing the grant application, I include all of that stuff in the grant application. So I've got them, we've got the money to be able to manage potential risk. Yeah, I would say that would be one of the, um, one of the things I, that first came to my mind was it's more about currently in the current climate, it's more about the people stopping and gathering yeah. around one another. And if the windows are all close together, then what's the flow of traffic? How do we support the flow of traffic? who's in who's there you know there's just some things i would say and if you go on the outdoor arts website though there's some risk assessments you can check out that might be able to help you with some of that and also uh, greenwich and docklands went ahead this year and did their outdoor festival they had some really clear specific rules and guidelines on their website and information that told people about coming to those events that were in person and they were things like if you can please cycle if you are attending, wear a mask. If you haven't booked a ticket, you won't get in. So there are lots of things that they were specifically saying, which was amazing. And it was so clear and very well communicated. But who knows, in January, there might have been a vaccine that's been dropped from the air and we're all 
find to yeah. you know we might have a government that knows what it's doing <laughs> well i'm <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> thank you